The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, our loving Father, through the grace of your Holy Spirit, you plant the gifts of your love into the hearts of your faithful people. Grant to your servants soundness of mind and body, so that they may love you with their whole strength and with their whole heart. Do these things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome to a Gospel Podcast for the fifth Sunday of Epiphany from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. This is a fresh podcast because the last time we did this Series C, uh, Epiphany was shorter. So you're going to get three fresh podcasts here on Luke 5, and then two on the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. So let's get started. Uh, This is a very uh, wonderful text, and as you know, in the course of the the Epiphany season, we have a sort of a continuous reading uh, up to this point through Luke 4 and Luke 5. Uh, Two weeks ago, we did what I call the, the, the prophet Christology, the Sermon in Nazareth, And if you remember in the commentary, I did a thing concerning the ecclesiology of Luke, that he actually is building an ecclesiology, that the first part of the ecclesiology, of course, from from Luke 4, is a Christology that that the church is founded on Christ. And I think that's a very important text for Luke. It's programmatic. It may be one of the most important texts there is. And then last week's pericope with the the um, the miracles and on account of what I sent, you know, the good news, preach the good news, that is the kingdom of God. This is why I sent. It's sort of an illustration of that prophet Christology, that Jesus is a, a teacher and a miracle worker. And that that work was the work of the new creation. Now we begin another part of the, the uh, ecclesiology here in Luke 5. And I say this carefully, but I think you, you'll understand what I mean. Um, it's founded on Peter. Peter is the rock. He is the first among equals in the 12. And it's not so much Peter per se as it is what I think we'll see is the main accent of this pericope, and that is that it's founded on the Office of the Keys, on the the Declaration of Absolution. So you can see here that that Epiphany is not only teaching us who Jesus is, but it's also teaching us what the Church is. And in that sense, it's a most remarkable text. Now, let's let's briefly look at the structure here. The first three verses, I think, are the introduction where Jesus is teaching the crowd from the boat. And I and I want to accent the boat and the nets. I mean, I put it in blue here, but look at how often that is accented. And I and I think there is kind of a churchly thing here. You know, Jesus is on the boat. The Jesus on the boat means Jesus is in his church. And if you read the commentary, I I do cite from Luther there his little allegory about how the nets are the sacraments that bring the Gentiles and the Jews into the boat. But you can see how important the boat is and how important, you know, Jesus being on the boat. Now, notice that the people are coming here, the Hakalan, these are the faithful remnant. And this is an infinitive of purpose in order to hear the word of God, you know. And, and I, I think it's fair to say, I've said this before in the commentary, that, that these are catechumens. That's a hearer of the word is a catechumen. And people coming to hear the word means that they are catechumens. And here Jesus is by the, the, the lake, Gennesaret, and um, he sees the two boats standing by the, by the lake. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful sort of descriptive way for Luke to get us into this text. Uh, they're washing their nets. You know, you can see how important that is. He, you know, the fishermen are washing their nets. And then after stepping into one of the boats, one of Simon, and of course, this is Peter. He's the most important person here. We're going to see at the end the sons of Zebedee 
are going to be re referenced. So you've got the big three here, the ones who go on the Mount of Transfiguration, who view Jairus' daughter's resurrection, Peter, James, and John. They're the big three. Um, he, he sees Simon's boat, he gets into the boat, and he asks them to put out a little bit from the land. And sitting down, he uses the boat as the place of teaching. Now there's a frame here. He, people are coming to hear him, and so he obliges. And the boat is a place of teaching. Now, you can clearly see the churchly implications here. That is what the church is. As Luther said, it's a mouth house. And here you can see how clearly in this opening introduction that Luke is, is setting us up for the boat as a place for the presence of Jesus through his teaching. Now, as we move down a little bit here, um, I think you can see that the next part of the text, verses 4 to 7, um, introduce us to this miraculous catch of fish by Peter and the other disciples. And um, you can see here, Simon starts, starts us out here, and he, you know, he tells Simon to do something that Simon, I think, is, is resisting a little bit here. Um, he, is, he, he asks him to go out into the deep, bathos, this word, by the way, is going to be used in Luke 24 for the deep dawn of Easter morning. Not that there is any great connection there, but it's just a wonderful word. Word, And he asked him to lower his nets in order for a catch. Now, Simon responds to him, master, which is, you know, not quite, it's a, it's a common word, it's a, it's a, it's a good title. Um, you know, he says, we've been working hard all night. We have, we have took nothing, but, and here's the important word, at your word. And notice it's remati. This is the word, uh, let it be to me according to your word. The passion predictions are called remati. Uh, at the end of the gospel, the, the words that Jesus speak are remati, not logos. These are, these are the teachings of Jesus. Um, but he, he believes the word of Jesus. And, you know, he hasn't really been called yet, but he must know enough about Jesus, and he must recognize that this is somebody whose word he must obey. So he lets down the nets. And then, of course, the rest of this is this um, description in 6 and 7 of the great catch of fish. To the point where the nets are breaking. Uh, this is this is an extraordinary miracle, and it's it's extraordinary that both boats are that are almost sinking. So I mean, it's over the top. It's like the feeding of the five thousand. With Jesus, there is always more. There is always more. So notice we're going from teaching to miracle, and there is your prophet Christology teaching Jesus as a teacher, and then the great miracle. And some of you who preached on the text last week, you know, it is necessary for me to preach the good news that is the kingdom of God, because this is why I was sent. This is the good news, that Jesus comes as the teacher, the one who not only speaks for God, but is God, and his miracles testify to his presence in the creation, bringing in a new creation. So the good news, the kingdom of God, is that Jesus is bringing in this new creation. Now, in many ways, this is all a prelude to what I oftentimes say is the most important part of the text. And that is the confession of Peter and the absolution that you have here uh, in verse 10. And... I love that he's now called Simon Peter. So Luke is, is giving us his, his Jewish name and then the name that is sort of given to him by Jesus. And Simon Peter there, you know, is absolutely struck there in verse 8. And he does a, an act of proskuneo, worship. He falls down, and it says, it's so clear, he falls down on his knees and he says to Jesus, depart from me, 
because I am a sinful man, Lord. Now, why is Peter doing this? Well, Peter recognizes in this great miracle the presence of what the demon said last week, the Holy One, sorry, the Holy One, let me start over here. What he recognizes here is the Holy One of God. And Peter recognizes, even though he may not yet confess him as the Christ, he knows that he is in the presence of holiness and that he is a sinner. And therefore, he is afraid. He is afraid of what can happen to him as a sinner in the presence of holiness. And it, it is a remarkable confession. And this is why it, it, we're going to see this is the absolution. Be not afraid. You, it's all right to stand in my presence. Um, this confession and this absolution, uh, this is your office of the keys. And this is what the church is founded on. And it's given to Peter. Simon Peter, there he is. And he is a cornerstone, you know. In the next pericope, we're going to see evidences of absolution. We're going to see the cleansing of a leper. And um, we're going to see that, that, you know, absolution is more than just simply saying your sins are forgiven you. It, it, is, it includes healing. It's the release from the bondage of sin, death, and the devil. That was the whole point of the sermon in Nazareth, that, that, that God has come to release the captives whether it be sickness or sin or the devil or death. Um, verse 9 is, is a lovely uh, way of, of seeing how not only Peter, but just about everybody is, this is that thombos, that thought, you know, that amazement that takes everybody. And I think, you know, that I, I translated it, odd amazement seized him and all those with him at the catch of fish that they had caught. And it, here they are, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the big three. And it, it says very clearly, they were companions of Simon. So it's not just Simon who's part of this. I mean, you you have the, the, the foundation of the church is not just Peter, but it's James and John. And as we're going to come to find out, it's going to be all of the apostles. Uh, that's going to become very evident when we see the Sermon on the Plain. So what does Jesus say to Simon? Be not afraid. This is what uh, the angel said to Mary, which was an absolution. Before that, to Zechariah. I think here it's really powerful because it's in the context of this great miracle and Peter's acknowledgement that he is not worthy to stand in the presence of this one who can make such an incredible catch of fish. Um, and then he, he, it's, it, it, this is very important, and I, and I think we sometimes miss this. Confession and absolution always leads to mission. And immediately after the absolution, Jesus, in a sense, you know, calls him and commissions him from now on. You will be, and this is unique to Luke, catching men alive. I love that expression. And it's not going to be fish, but it's catching men alive. Now, I think you can see how clearly this was, you know, um, captured by the, the, uh, the, the disciples here. And, you know, they bring their boats to land. This is the conclusion of the text. Um, and having left all things, you know, now you're going to see, Jesus is going to say this in Luke 9 and Luke 10 when he calls, when, excuse me, when he sends the 12 and the 70, you know, take nothing on the harvest, depend on the hospitality of others. And, and you can see they're leaving everything behind and to follow him or to become his disciples and, and, to, and to be, in a sense, now entering into a three-year sort of you know, process of becoming apostolic. And uh, that following him is, is really a, a really wonderful uh, conclusion to this brilliant text. Um, uh, you, you just 
have to grasp the, the, the absolute wonder of how the evangelist has now placed us in a position where we can see how to a Gentile community, he is showing them what the foundation stones of the church are. And um, even though it's not part of the Epiphany season, the call of Matthew indicates that the church is founded on a gospel. And I think it's where Luke doffs his hat to Matthew as the first gospel. And then in the calling of the Twelve, I mean, the official calling of them, um, you can see that the church is founded then on the, the Twelve Apostles, the reconstitution of Israel. And the Sermon on the Plain, which we're going to be looking at in the next two weeks, uh, is the teaching that is the foundation for that. So I encourage you to, to look up that little piece that I have here on the ecclesiology of Luke. Um, it, it, I think it, it's best seen in, the, in the, um, the outline of the Galilean ministry. This is on page 177, and it, it, it kind of rolls down there. And, you know, it, it's not only that he establishes the, the, the foundation stones, Chris, the, the, the person of Jesus, Peter, Matthew, and the Twelve, but then after that, he illustrates it with some, some pericopes that would have been something that would have been very helpful for the Gentiles to understand the ramifications of this. So continue enjoying Luke in this season of Epiphany and the fact that Luke is not only showing us who Jesus is, but if we know who Jesus is, we know what the church is, because the church is the body of Christ.